Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. You can find me at ColleenPatrickGaudreau.com, or if that's annoying to spell, you can find me at JoyfulVegan.com. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, I encourage you to subscribe to Food for Thought at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. If you are enjoying this free podcast called Food for Thought, I just ask that you share it with others and leave ratings and reviews. Word of mouth really is the best way to increase its listenership and supporting it is the best way to keep it going. You can go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to support this work. You can also go to joyfulvegan.com and you can click on the donate button. And I encourage you to do this, especially if you already subscribe, if you already listen, and if you already get anything out of this podcast at all. Thank you in advance. And of course, the spots are filling up for the best conference on the planet coming up, the Compassion in Action Conference here in Oakland in August. So go to compassioninactionconference.com. And if you forget that, it's joyfulvegan.com and you click on events and join me for a life-changing, life-enhancing event where you will connect with dozens of like-minded men and women to learn to be the most effective, the most joyful ambassador of compassion you know. We'll be talking all about effective advocacy, effective communication, about how to remain joyful and hopeful in a challenging world, practicing self-compassion. And talking all about zero waste principles. It's inspirational, it's informational, and it's all about joy. Put your compassion into action and join me in August. Today's topic is food waste part one, how animal products hinder zero waste living. I am about to give you some numbers, so pay attention. Ready? As much as 40% of the food Americans buy gets thrown out. Just let that penetrate for a moment. As much as 40% of the food Americans buy gets thrown out. And for those of you who are not in North America, you're not out of this either. Uh, Let me rephrase this. Of the edible food Americans buy, almost half goes uneaten and gets thrown into the garbage. This translates to $165 billion worth of perfectly good food that's discarded And it translates further to 160 billion pounds of perfectly edible food that clogs up landfill. So 165 billion dollars, 160 billion pounds of good food that clogs up dumps. I'm almost done, but not quite. Organic matter, i.e. food, in these dumps, in these landfills, accounts for 20% of all methane emissions which of course you know about methane. It's a potent greenhouse gas that contributes considerably to climate change. And even more broadly, one third or 1.3 billion tons of global food production is either wasted or goes uneaten. This is before it even gets into stores or into homes. All this despite the fact that 49 million Americans live without sufficient access to safe and nutritious food. All this despite the number of studies that have established that reducing food loss and reducing food waste plays a substantial role in achieving food security and climate change uh, mitigation. The bad news is we have a problem here. The sad news is we're creating it. The good news is we can solve it. Are you with me? When you think about the amount of food that gets wasted or goes uneaten, we're talking about two components. So this is what I want you to to start thinking about when you think about food waste. You've got food loss and you've got food waste. Food loss occurs at the front end of the food chain, at the production and harvest and processing levels. Food waste occurs toward the back end of the food chain, at the retail and consumer levels. So again, food loss, represents the edible portion of food available for human consumption that's not consumed. And food waste is a subset of food loss. It generally refers to the deliberate discarding of food because of human action or human inaction. Typically, the wealthier the country, the higher its per capita rate of food waste. Food loss, however, is far less prevalent in industrialized nations than in the developing world, which tends to lack the infrastructure to deliver all of its food safely and intact to consumers who are eager to eat the food, but don't get to because of these infrastructure deficiencies, and so they go hungry. Hunger is still one of the most urgent development challenges, according to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 
And yet, in an age where almost a billion people go hungry, the world is producing more than enough food to feed everyone. Remember that number I gave you earlier? Up to one third of all food is spoiled or spilled or lost before it's consumed by people, really even before it's purchased by people. And remember when we talked in my last episode about the principles of zero waste? Well, you can see one of them clearly here, the lack of infrastructure and distribution that results in wasted food. It also results in wasted labor, wasted water, wasted energy, and wasted land and all of the waste from the other inputs that went into producing that food. So it's a lot of waste. This is why aspiring to live zero waste in our own lives is just that. It's an aspiration and a worthy one, but it's also why we need to consider the waste that occurs long before goods enter our lives as consumers, okay? We can't just ignore all those systems that we as consumers still contribute to, but we may turn away from because we think we have no control or we think we have no power. And so we just focus on reducing waste in our own homes. Certainly the latter is important, but we must understand the larger picture if we're to be really effective. To help you think of this categorically, according to a comprehensive study from 2017, called Losses, Inefficiencies, and Waste in the Global Food System. It's actually quite fascinating reading. I'm going to recommend you read it. It's called Losses, Inefficiencies, and Waste in the Global Food System. It was published in a journal called Agricultural Systems, which I'm sure you subscribe to. Food losses were considered in six categories. So here are the six categories. And remember, as supporters at $10 and above uh, per month, you get all of the transcripts. So you'll be able to see this in writing here. But here are the six categories. So it's easy to follow. Agricultural production, losses that occur in the production process, right? So these losses include agricultural residues like roots of a, of a crop and straw. Uh, it also includes unharvested crops and the losses during harvest. So that's, that's the number one loss, agricultural production. Number two, this isn't in any order. Number two is livestock production. This is the losses and inefficiencies in the conversion of feed and grass into animal products. You've most certainly heard about that over the years. Number three is handling, storage, and transportation losses due to spillage and degradation during storage and distribution. These losses occur both for primary crops and animal products. Number four is processing, losses that occur during the processing of commodities. Number four, consumer waste, the losses and waste between food reaching the consumer and being eaten. And number six is an interesting category you've probably never really thought of, I didn't until I read this study, uh, is overconsumption, the additional food intake over that required for human nutrition. I never thought about that in terms of food waste, but it is a very interesting consideration. So. When we think of food waste in general, it's pretty complex. And as this study emphasizes inefficiencies and losses in agricultural production and consumer behavior all play a role. And we're going to get to the consumer behavior, like consumer waste and overconsumption in part two coming up. But I just want to give you a broad perspective on how to look at food waste and emphasize the role played both by larger systems and by individuals. Because once we have an understanding of the problem on both levels, we can begin to address the solutions. But before we can talk about how we can prevent food waste in our own lives and in our own homes, we first need to acknowledge the points at which food loss, this category of food waste, begins. We have to look all the way back to the waste involved in harvesting, storing, packing, producing, processing, and transporting food, mechanisms and infrastructures we may be able to influence and we may be able to help improve or that we don't wanna be part of because of the amount of inherent unavoidable waste in certain systems, okay? So again, just to keep you thinking about food loss from a big picture, harvested apples that fall off a truck, they're considered food loss. Food loss might occur because of an insect or mold infestation or a weather calamity, all of which destroy crops. In animal agriculture, imagine outbreaks of disease such as mad cow, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mastitis, or foot and mouth disease, all of which results in the animals being killed and never brought to market. That's food loss. Not that I consider animals food. You get the idea. I'm going to talk about this a little later on. But in terms of the structures we're talking about, they are considered food. 
Another example is when the crops aren't up to some kind of standard, whether standards of appearance or size or color or species, which we'll also talk about. In urban areas, fruit and nut trees often go unharvested because people either don't realize uh, that the fruit is edible or they fear that it's contaminated, despite research that shows urban fruit is quite safe to consume, or they haven't knocked on the door of the person who owns that tree to ask if they could harvest some of their lemons. I have to admit, I walk a lot in my neighborhood and in other neighborhoods, and I cringe when I pass lemon trees or orange trees loaded down with fruit, um, some on the ground that will rot, no doubt, because it's perfectly edible, but it's going to rot. And sometimes when I'm with friends on a walk or hike, we'll harvest some fruit or nuts from these trees or from the ground. Uh, But... I see a lot of other trees that I don't pick from uh, that home residents would never be able to consume all of and are letting the fruit rot. So one of the things I've decided to do in my zero waste quest is besides doing some kind of urban foraging is kind of along those lines is to knock on the door when I see trees overloaded and just ask if I can take some. Most of the time, people are happy to let you take what they know is going to go to waste so they don't wanted to go to waste. So letting fruit rot uh, in an urban situation where there's fruit trees, that's an example of food loss. Remember Paul Palmer, the man who coined the term zero waste in the name of his now defunct company, Zero Waste Systems, and founder of the Zero Waste Institute. And if you don't remember, go listen to the Food for Thought podcast episode called Zero Waste, It Ain't About Recycling. Well, he writes in his book, Getting to Zero Waste, thus, he writes, Do you imagine that potato peels are the only wasted input from the potato you had for dinner? Not even close. That potato came from a giant farm that used tractors, laborers, chemicals, energy, water, and clean air, as well as buildings and roads. A piece of all that attaches to your potato, and it's a lot more significant in using up the planet than your mere peelings. Ditto for your computer, your furniture, your clothing, your phone, your DVDs, your carpeting, your kitchen utensils, and everything else you use. Creating all of that doesn't depend very much on you, but your tiny fraction of that depredation of the earth is very measurable indeed. End quote. Now, Like I said in the first episode on zero waste, there's a lot to think about, and we need to take a whole systems approach. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do something at every level we can. Don't do nothing because you can't do everything. Do something, anything, right? Now, of course, we want to prevent waste at the consumer level, and I've got a gazillion ideas to share with you, and there's so much we can do. But there are lots of things to consider when buying that potato. Who grew it? How was it grown? How far did it travel to get to your plate? How many resources were used in the growing of it? What type of resources were used in the growing of it? How many resources were wasted in the growing, harvesting, processing, and transporting of it, right? And what could be done about it? So all of these are considerations. As for food loss in terms of solutions, there are organizations and companies and individuals working on preventing food loss. And you can certainly get on board with these larger organizations and companies. You can support them. You can help them out. Uh, you can work with them. For instance, in developing nations, aid organizations are providing small-scale farmers with storage bins and multi-layer grain sacks. Uh, They're supplying tools for drying and preserving vegetables and fruits and low-tech equipment for cooling and packing produce. And losses because of these resources are shrinking, according to a National Geographic article I'm going to share with you on the Joyful Vegan website. In the UK, where government has made food waste reduction a national priority, a grassroots group called Feeding the 5,000 collects high quality produce from farms and packers that has been rejected by supermarkets and cooks it into elaborate lunches served to 5,000 diners for free in the name of raising awareness and celebrating creative solutions. This is just one example of many in the United States. An estimated 6 billion pounds of produce is wasted each year because of its appearance. Entire shelves of perfectly edible shell peas, for instance, are sent to dumpsters to make room for incoming ones. Pallets of zucchini are rejected because they curve too much. This is true. If the affected wholesaler can't quickly find another market nearby, like a discount chain that tolerates curvy vegetables or a food bank with refrigerated space, the load will be dumped into a landfill. 
An example of a solution to this, uh, one domestic company here in the United States, actually here in California, creatively tackling this issue is called Imperfect Produce. I actually used them for a short time. It sells less than ideal looking produce at discounted rates. You can sign up to receive a box of produce and it's delivered to your door. A similar concept has developed in France. There's a company named Intermarche that uh, publicizes promotional videos to encourage people to buy ugly food. So there are things being done at this level. And these solutions are great. And there are many more. Improvements in harvesting and distribution and storage and transportation are great and they're necessary in order to make a difference. But in all of my research on global food loss and food waste, I didn't see a lot of mention of the elephant in the room. The fact that, quote, the highest food losses from any stage are associated with livestock production. Now, it's not to say that these problems, these other problems I just named, shouldn't be tackled. They should be, and they are, and that's all noble. But there's an even bigger culprit. That study I mentioned earlier that I want you to read, Losses, Inefficiencies, and Waste in the Global Food System, It considers the interconnectedness of the food system and the losses occurring in it. It was published as recently as 2017, 2017, for the purpose of getting a more accurate picture of global food loss and accounting for data that haven't been considered in previous studies, including the one that's cited most regularly, the study by Gustafsson and his team in 2011, the one that says one third of food produced is lost before it's eaten. I quoted that in the very beginning. This 2017 study sets out to improve on that 2011 one. And I uh, have a copy of it, as I said, at joyfulvegan.com. But I want to share with you the author's conclusions. I won't pause and wait for you to go read the whole thing. I will give you the conclusions, which perhaps may not be surprising to many of you, but it's striking nonetheless and worthy of memorizing and sharing, memorizing and sharing, memorizing and sharing until it's in your brain and in the brains of everyone you know. So here's an excerpt from the study. Here's the, an excerpt from the final section called Conclusions. Quote, both consumer behavior and production practices play crucial roles in the efficiency of the food system. We said that earlier. The greatest rates of food loss were associated with livestock production. Consequently, changes, listen up, in the levels of meat, dairy, and egg consumption can substantially affect the overall efficiency of the food system and associated environmental impacts, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. It is therefore regrettable from environmental and food security perspectives that rates of meat and dairy consumption are expected to continue to increase as average incomes rise potentially lowering efficiency of the overall food system, as well as increasing associated negative health implications, for example, diabetes and heart disease. I repeat, consumer behavior plays a crucial role in the efficiency of the food system. The greatest rates of food loss were associated with livestock production, and consequently, changes in the levels of meat, dairy, and egg consumption can substantially affect the overall efficiency of the food system and associated environmental impacts, i.e. (laughs) e.g. greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, how long have we known this? We've known this for a long time. And the question I ask is, what is it going to take before we do something about it? We have the information we need. Francis Moore LePay's book, Diet for a Small Planet, which influenced a lot of people. It was written in 1971. It was the first major book to document the environmental impacts of meat production as being wasteful and as a contributor of global food scarcity. And we knew that long before LePay wrote her book. LePay just put it down in a very readable book that sold more than 3 million copies. So it's not like people don't have this information. And the conclusion she too drew was that eating plant foods, not animal products is the best thing we can do for people and the planet, not to mention the animals in terms of concerns about food security, global warming, poverty and hunger, and the integrity of the environment as a whole. These conclusions are just another example of us having the data we need to make different decisions and to change our behavior for the betterment of our health, for the animals, and for the planet. We have the information. We have the answers. It's a matter, first of all, of course, of knowing if the data even exists. And so now you you have the data. You can't say you didn't know it exists. And then two, it's a matter of, uh, well, sharing it. And it's a matter of implementing it. So what are you willing to do? 
While you mull that over, I want to make sure that I thank all of you for listening and I thank all of you for subscribing and all of you who are supporting this podcast, my blog, my work in general, enabling me to share the tools and resources people need to cause as little harm as possible. I want to thank all of you who are listening and subscribing and supporting right now. And if you are getting anything out of this, then please join fellow supporters, including our platinum supporters, Tim Anderson and Renee Marinkovich and David Cabrera and Alexander Gray. You've heard these names before. You can join this list. Morgan Hall, Michal Stone and Ulrich. We've got gold supporters. We've got silver supporters. You can join at any level you like. $10 and above gets you the transcripts, the written transcripts of any and all episodes. And I'm so grateful for your generous support. The more resources I have, the more I can accomplish. So please support this work at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. So how is it that the greatest rates of food loss were associated with livestock production? Well, let's take a look at where this waste takes place in the production and harvesting stages. First of all, you have the inherent inefficiencies in calorie conversion and resource use, resulting in a lot of loss, as demonstrated by the study I cite from 2017. We've heard about this for years. This is nothing new to you. You've heard this for years and years. Here are some facts. I encourage you to memorize. Memorizing facts and memorizing things we really want to understand uh, is a really helpful way to really absorb what it is we, we want to to understand. So I always encourage uh, memorizing when we can. And these are short and these are not sweet, but they're short. (laughs) About 30% of the world's total surface, ice-free surface, about 30% of the world's total surface is used not to raise grains, fruits, and vegetables that are directly fed to human beings, many of whom are hungry, but to support the chickens, pigs, and cattle we bring into this world only to kill. Not a great use of, of resources. Livestock production, which includes, of course, animal milk, animal meat, and eggs, uses one third of the world's fresh water. You've heard also of the water and grain that's used to produce a small amount of of beef. So, you know, there's a lot of different numbers thrown around about water. Right now, kind of the middle ground is 2,500 gallons of water are needed to produce one pound of beef. Uh, Worldwide, at least 50% of the grain is fed to livestock. So all of this should be familiar to you already, how inefficient it is to process nutrients through animals rather than going directly to the plants for the nutrients. And there are a lot of resources you can read and watch uh, for, for more about that. But let's look at other ways waste is inherently high in the livestock industry. Maybe some considerations you hadn't you hadn't thought of before. Remember, I mentioned the outbreak of a disease like mastitis on a dairy farm or mad cow or bovine spongiform encephalopathy on a cattle operation can cause food loss. And yes, I don't consider animals food, but in the context of our topic, this is food loss because the animals were being raised solely as food or for their secretions that are sold as food. An example of this, I'm not sure if you remember this, but in 2001, there was an outbreak of what's called foot and mouth disease in the United Kingdom because of fears of it spreading among the animals. Humans rarely get infected by it. So this was absolutely about just protecting their crops. Uh, And because farmers didn't want to vaccinate their animals for fears of what it would mean for future exports, between 6 million and 10 million cows, pigs, and sheep were killed and thrown into a pit and burned. There's speculation that the number is like closer to 10 million, but 6 million is what you'll often see. If it's 6 million, it's still high. And, you know, even for those of us who don't consume animals, the idea that that they're brought into this world even for naught, that they're brought into this world and then killed and just thrown into pits and burned. I mean, it's just such, I mean, it's, we know it's a waste. It's wasted lives. It's just a waste in every, in every sense. And I remember seeing images of those burning pits. I was working for a nonprofit in San Francisco at the time. And I remember sitting at my desk and looking at news stories and the photos uh, of those burning pits. And it was, it was horrific. I remember it like it was yesterday, wasted lives, just waste. In 2003, in the Netherlands, there was an epidemic of avian influenza. It broke out um, at the time. One person died. 30 million birds were killed. Again, not and in all of these situations where all these animals were killed, they call it a cull. Most of the animals were not infected. 
it's done as a preventative measure. So 30 million birds were killed. As recently as 2015, you may remember the outbreak of avian influenza, uh, H5N2. It, uh, identified, uh, it was identified in a series of uh, chicken and turkey animal factories in the Midwest in the United States. As a result, more than 43 million birds in 15 states were killed as a result of the outbreak, including nearly 30 million in Iowa alone. That's the nation's largest egg producer. No human cases were reported. Human infection is almost impossible. However, these are examples of high waste and high costs of that waste. A lot of costs in, in something like that, in land-based animal agriculture. In fact, loss in the harvesting stage is rampant in aquatic-based animal agriculture as well. We see this take place in the fish industry in a number of ways, such as in cosmetic standards that the fish are held up to. Just like fruits and vegetables, if the fish don't meet standards in size and species, they're discarded uh, and they're just dead. I mean, they're just discarded and their lives mean absolutely nothing. And then there are the millions of aquatic animals who are killed and thrown away by the fishing industry as a matter of course in the form of the bycatch victims, those individuals who are the non-target species in the fish industry, but who are valueless once they're caught and identified as non-target species, and they're just left to die, left to rot. Most are either thrown back into the ocean as rubbish. Uh, Most are thrown back dead, dying, or seriously injured, and they die eventually. So that's an example of waste. In the fish industry, according to the World Wildlife Fund, 40% of worldwide fish catch is bycatch. So when we're eating fish, we are supporting the bycatch, which means that 40% of the fish that's caught is bycatch. And that amounts to 38 million tons. You know, aquatic animals are not counted as individuals. They're counted by weight. So that's why we have a lot of weight. There are some individuals who are counted, and this is mostly because of nonprofit groups working more uh, on these uh, animals. But uh, Some more disturbing numbers, 300,000 small whales and dolphins, 250,000 endangered loggerhead turtles and critically endangered leatherback turtles, 300,000 seabirds. So across the spectrum here, we're talking about about 300,000 small whales and dolphins, turtles and seabirds, including albatross uh, species, are killed as bycatch every year. Catching shrimp in trawl nets can kill up to 10 pounds of other animals for each pound of shrimp. According to the nonprofit Oceana, an estimated 50 million sharks are caught unintentionally each year, which is about half as many sharks as the estimated 100 million sharks killed by the commercial fishing industry per year for meat and fin. So you've got, you know, 100 million Sharks killed for the uh, for the fishing industry uh, for meat, and, and then about 50 million sharks are killed uh, just as bycatch. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, one in four animals caught in fishing gear dies as bycatch, meaning that each year millions of animals are killed just as bycatch. So it was a lot of wasted lives. It's just a lot of waste. And then you've got just the built-in waste in the animal products industry, such as the zoonotic diseases, which according to the World Bank, account for 70% of emerging infectious diseases, and which means millions of pounds of animal flesh and secretions that get thrown away because of a salmonella outbreak that results in the recall of millions of eggs, or an outbreak of Campylobacter that results in the recall and destruction of millions of pounds of chicken flesh or E. coli, etc. And there's a ton of waste created in plant products as well because they're created by foodborne illnesses, which if you remember from the Food for Thought episode called The Lethal Gifts of Livestock, these outbreaks are caused by plant crops being contaminated one way or another by animal waste. So you can have an insect or mold infestation destroy a crop like we said way back in the harvesting stage, but the only way you get an outbreak of a foodborne illness that can kill people or make them very ill uh, from plants, from plants, plant consumption, plants, is because of animal products that contaminated the plants. People don't die from aphids on their kale or borer worms on their corn, but they can die from Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, and those are all zoonotic diseases. They all originate in animals, not plants. Uh, and the only way these plants are ever blamed for these diseases is because they were contaminated by animal waste. Does that make sense? Speaking of 
inherent waste in the animal agriculture industry, you have all the literal waste. Literally the urine and excrement that the plants don't have, that is wreaking havoc on natural ecosystems, lakes and rivers, and on human health. According to the USDA, every minute, 7 million pounds of excrement are produced by animals raised for human consumption in the U.S., This doesn't include the animals raised outside of USDA jurisdictions or in backyards or the billions of fish raised in aquaculture settings in the U.S. So 7 million pounds of excrement a minute is underestimating the amount of waste that's created. And we're only talking about the U.S. here. You can get those numbers for other countries as well. And then finally, when you consider the waste in terms of the leftover body parts on the processing end of this animal slaughter industry, after considering this waste in terms of the leftover body parts in the processing end of the animal slaughter industry, perhaps you're ready for the 30-day vegan challenge now. After the billions of animals are killed and cut up into bits that are then sold for people to eat, Are you aware of how much is left of the inedible parts, like the bones and the bladders, the diaphragms and the lungs, the sphincter muscles and the fat, the external parts like the heads and the feet and the hooves and the skin and the hair or the udders, the liquids like the blood and the urine, the solids like the feces and the stomach contents? Well, I can tell you all of it accounts for about 49% of a cattle carcass, 44% of a pig, 37% of a chicken, and 57% in most fish species. Hence, waste. (laughs) All over the world, 60 billion farmed animals are slaughtered every year. And that number is predicted to double by 2050. And we're talking about half, almost half of the bodies of these animals are not eaten by people. And so what you have is all of this waste. Now, this slaughterhouse waste is stored in huge containers outside slaughterhouses until tankers come to take them away, at which point it's disposed of in municipal sewers, in incineration plants, or if possible, made into slaughterhouse byproducts, including feed for animals and feed for humans. Fat is made into tallow. Tallow is used as a key ingredient in lipstick and eye makeup. Blood and bones are rendered into blood meal and bone meal for fertilizer. Feathers are rendered into feather meal to add to farm animal feed, yes, that other animals are forced to eat. Many commercial pet foods add rendered waste that includes beaks and feathers and hair. And then there's the blood, of which there are huge, huge quantities. Just imagine the blood from 60 billion animals. Imagine the blood from one. Imagine the blood from five. Imagine the blood from a thousand. I mean, it's just, it's incomprehensible, the amount of blood that are then stored in huge vats, again, until tankers come to collect it from slaughterhouses. And they have to do it almost daily because of a noxious odor that develops from all of this blood. It's then processed to remove bacteria, and it's disposed of in sewers, in landfills, or it's spread over the land. Waste blood is also used in pet food. It's also used uh, for human consumption to make, like, blood sausage or black pudding. Of course, animal skins are used to make skin products, also called leather, and humans eat the resulting concoction made from boiled skin and tendons and ligaments and snouts and bones in the form of what's called gelatin. It's pretty innocuous sounding in such food products as marshmallows and jello and jellies and gummy bears and chewing gum and pharmaceutical gelatin-based capsules. Keratin, the etymology of which I talk about in the Animology podcast episode on that, uh, from uh, horns, hooves, feathers, and hair are also used or is also used. The keratin's also used in hair care products as well as body washes, lotions, and cosmetics. And we can't forget the hatchery waste, the dead, discarded male chicks who are killed upon birth in the egg industry. Don't forget 50% of the births in the egg hatchery industry, this is all related to the egg industry, 50% are male and they're all killed upon birth. These ground up babies are turned into fertilizer or farm animal feed, uh, including feed for other chickens. Hatchery waste is also fed to animals in zoos and wildlife parks, and some is sent to a dump. And just a little more waste to wrap this up. Waste from the fish industry is recycled, quote unquote, into fish meal and used in farmed animal feed, including farmed aquatic animals such as prawns. 
There is a notion that using up all of the slaughterhouse waste is a good thing. It's a noble thing because all of the animals used and not wasted. I've heard people wax poetic about how great it is that the slaughter industry recycles the waste left on the slaughterhouse floor. But not only did I just go through all of the waste that is created leading up to the slaughterhouse that you can't escape from, even leaving that aside, remember we talked uh, in the last episode about zero waste, about how zero waste is not about recycling. This is no different. We don't need to bring into this world only to kill 60 billion animals every year worldwide. And so that we do means that we have a tremendous amount of waste built in, built into this because of everything I just named. Built in because of the excrement, the urine, the large scale colds, the disease outbreaks, the zoonotic diseases, the foodborne illnesses. And because of half, the fact that half of the bodies of these animals we bring into this world only to kill are not used or not eaten. And so the industry found all these ways to make the remaining body parts profitable. This isn't because they're nobly trying to use all of the, uh, the animal. It's because they had to make it profitable in order to make the rest of the their their products profitable and because half of the animals are waste it's just built-in waste and it's rendered into more unnecessary crap so people ask things like well why why you know why do they use you know egg whites and why do they use fish bladders to to filter wine because they can because there's so much animal waste built into the slaughter industry that they're they try to find a way to use it and then it's get it gets passed on to us as consumers who don't necessarily want any uh, slaughterhouse waste in our food or in our products that we're buying. So the blood, the bones, the slaughterhouse byproducts exist only because so many billions of animals are killed. And a lot of it is just thrown into landfills as well. Don't forget, as I just said, a lot of it's thrown into landfills, incinerators, sewers, and spread over our land. I find nothing noble about that. It's dirty. It's disgusting. It's violent. It's unnecessary. It's garbage. No, literally it is. It's garbage because, hang tight, I'm about to blow your mind. The word garbage is an animology. Remember, if you don't already subscribe to Animology Podcast, an animology is a word or expression whose etymology has to do with animals. In this case, dead ones. The exact origins of the word garbage are unknown. But this Middle English word originally referred to offal, O-F-F-A-L. You've heard of that word before, as in the bowels and body parts of a butchered animal, often considered inedible by humans. The Oxford English Dictionary says it's probably from Anglo-French, like many other words found in early cookery books, but its original meaning, as far back as our sources go, for its first use was the offal of an animal used for food, especially the entrails. If you look in the origin section of any decent dictionary, you'll find the etymology of garbage is Middle English, awful from animals, from fowls, from chickens. In other words, there's kind of nothing zero waste about garbage. And I find all of this unacceptable, which is why I don't support these industries. But if you call yourself zero waste because your butcher puts your meat in a container you bring to the store with you, being zero waste is not about perfection just as being vegan is not about perfection and zero vegan is not about perfection but we need to at least be as honest as possible if we're going to do this if we're interested in eliminating the most amount of food waste as individuals this is just another reason to eat a plant-based diet or let me rephrase this If we're taking into account larger systems of food waste beyond the waste we accumulate in our own lives, beyond what we throw away, which we're going to cover in part two and I'm very excited about, then it's incumbent upon us to eat a plant-based diet, to eliminate animal products from our diet. In other words, zero waste living really needs to be zero waste vegan living in order to be consistent and effective. That's not my opinion. Those are the facts. When it comes to reducing food waste, the authors of the most comprehensive study on food loss and food waste conclude that eating fewer animal products will have the greatest impact. 
I hope you join me for that next episode uh, about how we can reduce and eliminate food waste as consumers in our own lives, in our own individual homes. I hope you also join me for the Compassion in Action Conference in August 2018. And I thank you for supporting this work at joyfulvegan.com for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. Thanks for listening.